Hey, Pastor Dwayne, along with my beautiful bride, Cameron, we want to invite you into a Sunday service. This has been previously recorded, but it is one of our Sunday services. And this message, I pray, is going to be a blessing to you as well as the atmosphere of our congregation. So God bless you as you join us in one of our Sunday services. What land has God given you? He's given you your health. He's given you wealth. He's given you influence. That's the Abrahamic covenant. He's given you your family. He's given you your extended family. Everything God's given you, you put your feet firmly on the ground and anything that doesn't align with what God's promised you, evict it out of, it, of your existence. He said in verse 5, no man will be able to stand before you for I will be with you. Be strong and of good courage over and over again. <clears throat> he says, Joshua, in the Hebrew, that's a, that's a command. That's not a suggestion. Be strong and of good courage. In other words, do not fear. That is a command. Yes. That's right. To live in fear is sin. Yes. What do you have to fear? You have to evict fear from your vocabulary. Evict doubt from your vocabulary. Amen. Know what God has promised you. Firmly plant your feet and be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide this as an inheritance that I swore to your fathers. That entire land that flowed with milk and honey, all of its wealth and its property, houses they didn't build and wells they didn't dig, it belonged to them because God gave it to them. You talk about a transfer of wealth. We've been in a season of transition, and this is God's supernatural provision. But how does God shift us into this new dimension, into this new realm? I want to point a couple of things out, and then I'm going to read this prophetic word. He came to Joshua in chapter 3, and the Bible said that they were in the acacia grove. In Hebrew, that is place of the thorns. If you go to Israel, some of you that went with us to Israel and we went to the spring at En Gedi and we walked down that path, those acacia trees were all in there with those thorns. You remember that? Where do you live just before entering into your promise and your destiny? You live among the thorns. And many of you have been in a season of attack like never before. Your body's been attacked, your mind, your family, your children, your relationships, your finances. Bring it to a larger scale. The ecclesia in the United States of America especially, we've never ever been under attack like we are today. This nation has been seized by thieves and crooks and criminals and Luciferians. But remember that the last season and the last place that you live just before coming in to the promise is a very uncomfortable place because God didn't do it, but he's allowed it so that you don't become so comfortable that you stay in the wilderness. I don't know about you, but I've been through enough in my life. I've experienced enough loss and suffering and pain and heartache that I cannot stay here any longer. I have to go where the milk and honey flows and where the grapes are gigantic and the provision of God is abundance. We are moving into a place of abundance if we'll get out from the thorns. So we just thank God for the thorns. They're in the place of the thorns. Many of you are in a very sticky, sticky position, a sticky place. It's just a sign that your destiny is about to come. Amen. The Bible says in chapter 3 in verse 15 that as they prepared to cross over into the promised land, the Jordan overflowed all of its banks during the whole time of harvest. Not only do you have the Jordan River between you and your destiny, but it's flooded. The barrier between you and your promise and your destiny is swollen, larger than ever. The enemy has made sure that when you look at your enemy that keeps you from your destiny, your ob the obstacle keeping you from God's promise, it's going to look larger now than ever before. Listen, in the natural, America is finished But God's not finished. 
God's not finished. I heard someone say the other day that when God talked to Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah, this was just their opinion. They said, I, I believe Abraham missed it. Because he said, will you save, it, save the nation if, if I can find 10 righteous? He said, what Abraham should have said is, Lord, will you save Sodom and Gomorrah for me? Because I'm righteous. We need to cry out to God and say, America is saved because I'm here. Yes. It's saved because I'm here. Yes. You know, it's kind of like Brother Jesse Duplantis before he came into his, his, his great abundance and he was having to fly commercial airlines. He was on a plane one time, he said, and, and there was turbulence and, and people were afraid and the pilot was going to think, he thought he had to make a crash landing and all these things. And Jesse said, I stood up and said, this plane is not going to go down because Jesse's on board. <laughs> Now, some people think that's arrogance. No, that's just, I'm certain of who I am. I know whose I am, and I have a destiny. I have a plan and a purpose, and the devil cannot kill me. The devil cannot take America out because this belongs to Jesus Christ. He's formed this nation, birthed this nation, called this nation, and he's our head, and no one ever drowned with their head above water. There are hundreds of millions of righteous people in this nation crying out to God. So what does it mean for the Jordan to be out of its banks? It means it's harvest time. You moving into your destiny and the supernatural provision of God is not about you. It's about God using you for the greatest harvest the world's ever known. This generation of young people in America are going to be radically saved and come radically to Jesus. And we have to be smart enough not to reject them because they don't look like us, talk like us, act like us. Some of them not going to smell like us. I'm just telling you, God's bringing them. And it's going to be our job to love them. Yeah. I was talking at lunch the other day with Apostle I mean, uh, Tony Bates and Bishop Steve McEwen, and we're talking about some things that we used to have in our church. We had this gigantic recovery ministry, and so on Sunday morning we'd have 100 or 150 or 200 people who hadn't been saved very long out of crack and meth and prostitution, and yes, and you know they don't know how to act in church. And they'd come down to the altar during the sec our second service in the worship. And, and uh, I mean, I looked across there one Sunday, and this, this couple was bumping and grinding in the altar. I'm talking about <laughs> to the worship music. They, and I had to slip over there and say, we don't do that in church. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Well, we don't do that in church. We don't bump and grind anymore. We got Jesus. <laughs> and we'd have young ladies who were in, listen, they were in a crack lab last week and they walked into church for the first time and, and, and the music was rocking like we were in here today and they're in the altar and they don't have a lot on. I had to teach all the men in the church to worship with their head up. I spent 20 years of ministry when we would have a prayer team down. I'd be down front and people would come down for prayer. I spent 20 years of ministry praying for women just like this. <laughs> then I got smart and I said, now you women come to the ladies for prayer and you men come to the men for prayer. Amen. I'm saying that to prepare you for what's about to happen. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Because they're coming. They've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And now they're going to try Jesus and he will work. Amen. And let me tell you, it was tough because I had a, a very old established church and transitioning that thing over those years with this generation. And you know, you know how many times I heard, now, Pastor, you need to do something about them and how they act and, and what they wear and 
And I said, well, just give us some time. We will. We, just give us a little time. But they weren't like you. They weren't born in Sunday school with perfect attendance pins knowing their memory verse. They were born in a crack house. Move on. Anyway, everybody say it's harvest time. I'm, I'm believing with the apostolic leaders that are over us that it is a minimum of a one billion soul harvest in this world. Then it, the Bible says that he told them, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, go after it. And listen to, listen to what he said. He said, for you have not passed this way before. You've not passed. In other words, everything that you have been familiar with that works, it's not going to work anymore. And what I'm about to do is not going to look anything like anything I've ever done before. And then he says in verse number five, he said, and when you go after this ark and you go after it in a way that you've not passed this way before, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. He said, I'm going to do, in verse 5, wonders among you. This word in Hebrew is distinguishing miracles. I, I'm going to, when you go after my glory, I'm going to do things in the atmosphere that people have never seen. <laughs> distinguishing miracles. Miracles that will set you apart. Before he was promoted to heaven, my mentor and spiritual grandfather, Dr. Marvin Gorman, a great man of great miracles, he prophesied that in central Arkansas and moving up into northwest Arkansas and into Oklahoma and down through Texas that there would be this great fiery awakening of the Holy Spirit and that it would manifest distinguishing miracles where the atmosphere of God would be so charged with glory that people would pull in off of the highways to give their life to Jesus and, and people would just walk into the building and be healed miraculously by the power of God. Let it be, Lord, let it be here and let it be now in the name of Jesus. But guess what? We have to do our part. What's that? Go after the glory. I'm not, I, not, not signs, wonders, and miracles. Don't seek signs, wonders, and miracles. Seek the glory of his presence. Yes. 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 He said, after they crossed over, I want you to take 12 men from the 12 tribes, take 12 stones out of the river and set them up as a monument for the next generation. Can I just say, listen, true, true ecclesia believers that are like myself and you have become seasoned. Yes. It's a way of saying that you're middle-aged and older. <laughs> hear me, hear me. This is strong in my heart. Our role is to take everything we've been through and set it up as a memorial to say to the generation beneath us, learn from us so you don't have to circle the mountain for 40 years. You can just move right into your destiny. I hate, the, I hate what the, the, the modern church has done to, to the church at large and, and, and dealt with generations this generation and this generation, a multi generational church. We're not a multi generational church, we're all one generation. Your age has nothing to do with what generation you're in. And God brings seasoned people into your life to spare you some pain and some suffering and some heartache. And God brings young people into our life to challenge us and stretch us and, and keep us young. Hallelujah. So he says, you take... 12 stones and you put them in the river. They took 12, 12, the number of government. That's the number of government of the kingdom. The number 12 is government. They put 12 stones, one from each tribe. And he later told them this place is called Gilgal. 
for I have removed the reproach. The word Gilgal in Hebrew means the reproach has been moved. And in Hebrew, it's almost like a wheel within a wheel that, that moves and spins. And God said, I have removed the reproach. When Jesus Christ came and God anointed him, baptized him in the Holy Ghost, and set him as the king and priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and he was ordained as a rabbi, do you know where that happened? Right here. Yeshua went to Gilgal. And that's where he was immersed. You remember when Yeshua said to, to, the, to the Pharisees, if these children hold their peace, I promise you that the very stones will cry out. He wasn't talking about the stones of Jerusalem. He was talking about the 12 stones at Gilgal where he was ordained and immersed into the priesthood as the Messiah and the king and priest. He said, if they don't declare me as the Messiah, then the promise God made Joshua will come up out of the water and say, hey, this promise of God, that's him in the flesh. And the reproach is rolled away. Can I just chase a rabbit for a moment? If you understood the authority and the power and the dominion of water baptism, we would ha never have a deliverance ministry ever again because when you go into that water, your heart is circumcised as a Gentile just like the foreskin was cut off the flesh of these men going into the promise and the reproach is rolled away, meaning everything that ever happened to you in your past, everything you did, everything that was done, whether you were abused, molested, raped or whatever took you buried it there God cut it away out of your heart and you came up out of the water completely whole and healed I'm, I'm back from chasing that rabbit but that's the truth so notice he says he says to them that this glory, this, this Jordan overflowing its banks, will, he will roll the reproach away as the ark comes into the water on the shoulders of his authority. And whenever they put their feet in that water, when the glory comes, it rolls the reproach away from the city of Adam, you would say Adam, of Zertan, all the way to the Salt Sea. Everybody say the Dead Sea. The Dead sea. When you go to Israel, you cannot get, we, we could not get for various reasons to the exact place where they crossed over, but we could see it. And from there to the city of Adam, down to the Salt Sea are many miles. Now watch, when God's glory hit the reproach, the thing, the barrier between them and their destiny, that reproach could be many things in your life. That reproach could be fear, doubt, unbelief, a physical problem, a financial setback. What's keeping you from moving into your destiny? But when the glory comes, it rolls it away. Adam, Adam, but Zertan in Hebrew is pierced. The reproach is rolled away off your life from the Adam who was pierced all the way to the Salt Sea, which is the, the, the doorway to the lake of fire. When God judges people at the great white throne, they're cast into the lake of fire. They'll be cast right into the Dead Sea at Sodom and Gomorrah, into the heart of the earth. Think about this. You'll shout and run the aisle if you just think about this for a moment. So when you and I came out of the wilderness into Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our covenant king, the reproach in my life was rolled away from the Adam who was pierced all the way to hell. Meaning the reproach against me has been taken care of from the cross to the end of my life. And that's what qualifies me now to come across on dry ground into the covenant promise. They weren't, they weren't qualified because they were good or godly or holy. They were qualified by the covenant promise of God. 
That's called great grace. You're going to have houses you didn't build and wells you didn't dig, and you're going to come into a land of milk and honey of abundant overflow, prosperity, and influence, not because you're all that, but because the Christ in you has made you all that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, he says in verse 17, so the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people completely crossed over, about three million people. The best way for you to see the shift that's under, underway right now and the shift that's taking place is I want you just to pretend that this is the Ark of the Covenant. This, is the, this pulpit's the Ark. And we're in the wilderness, camped out in the, in the thorny grove. We're camped out in the, in the acacia grove, in the uncomfortable place. Many of you are in a very uncomfortable place right now. And God commanded us tomorrow Everybody say today. today. You're going to go somewhere you've never gone before. You've, you've never passed this way before. What did he mean by that? When that ark hit that water and the reproach was rolled away from the Adam who was pierced to hell, they passed by on dry ground, three million people. And he said, there are so many cubits, you have to stay away from that glory. In this, there's a warning in this final outpouring of God's Spirit in the third day. There will be many people in ministry that will be removed because they got too close to the glory and claimed it for themselves. God's not going to share His glory anymore. That's why denominations are dying. So, can you imagine? You've heard the stories about the glory of God. You saw Moses come out of that tent just glowing because he had been near that. You've been following the, the cloud by day and the fire by night coming off that ark. For 40 years, that's all you've known. Manna, water from a rock, quail, cloud, fire. That's been your life. I mean, you've, all you've been your whole life is a sheep. All the citizenry of this nation has been in America for generations are sheep who just swallow everything that we're told. Oh, we've got a pandemic, so you got to put a mask on, take a jab, get this, do that. You can't go here. And, and the sheep of this nation just bowed down to the voice of the master. Because government had become our God. Forgive us, Lord. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. <laughs> Someone put a quote on Facebook the other day. Henry Kissinger. How many of you remember him? Yeah. Henry Kissinger said that long ago in the 70s, if we can ever get the sheep, and he called you sheep and me sheep, if we can ever get them in a state of panic and fear to the point that we can mandatorily vaccinate them, we have won. Now, I'm not sitting here criticizing you if you've been vaccinated. That's between you and the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctor and all that. Listen, that, I'm not talking about that. That's between you. That's a personal decision. I'm talking about government mandate. We've been sheep but we're about to become the shepherd. How does that happen? How does that happen? Can you imagine knowing all that you know about that ark? I don't know about you, but I would want my family, if we were in alphabetical order, I'd want my name to start with Z and I wanted to be on the far end yeah. away from that. But God said, don't be afraid of it. Go after it. My last name starts with an M, so I'm sure my family had to be right here in the middle of it. Can you imagine how careful you were to make sure you did not get too close? Because the electromagnetic field off of that arc, if you just got too close, that thing would fry you. 
But here's the shift. This is the kingdom shift. We leave the wilderness and the place of the thorns, and now we go where we've never gone before. Where is that? No longer behind the ark, but now in front of the ark. And the message that God's giving us in this third day is, you have been following my glory as sheep for 40 years, but now my glory is going to follow you as shepherds leading my glory into the next generation. And that's how the Jerichos fall. You go and stand your ground in front of that impenetrable enemy and my glory will be behind you. And when you circle that city seven times on the seventh day and then you blow the shofar and give a shout, it's my glory that will take those walls down. You don't have to try to come into your destiny. All you have to do is trust him to remove your enemies. But remember, don't touch the glory or you'll go to Ai and get your honey whipped because Achan took something that belonged to God. Another warning for all of us in this season. Financially, whatever God asks you for, you better give it to him. Because if you keep it for yourself, you might just get whipped. Now listen, from now on, the glory is following us. Every place God's given you, he said, put the sole of your feet there and call it yours. Cameron and I thank you for joining us in today's broadcast where we previously recorded a sermon on Sunday. And we hope it was a blessing to you to come into our congregation and our atmosphere on a Sunday morning service. Until next time, God bless you.